All right, welcome everybody. Uh, for for uh, thank you for uh, we're about a minute late here, but thank you for uh, coming in from the waiting room. Uh, my name is Joe Aiello. I'm the uh, field coordinator for the Rail Pastors Association. Welcome to I do believe this is our 19th webinar that we've been doing since uh, everything sort of started going online. So uh, a lot of you have, have, have joined us multiple times. A, lo a lot of great topics over the last couple of years. We have a great one for you today: uh, defining the needs of transit rail passengers in 2022 and beyond. Um, we are going to kick it off with uh, Sean Jeans Gale, uh, our own uh, VP uh, of Government Affairs, and uh, we have a great panel of speakers that Sean will uh, will intro and bio for you. Uh, be sure to keep yourself muted and keep your cameras off during the presentation. We will have a Q and A session after the presentations. We'll be taking questions from the floor, so please, when the chat is open, please uh, put your questions in, and, and we'll grab them when we can. We do have a number of pre-sent in questions ahead of time that we'll get to first. So uh, without further ado, uh, Sean, Sean Jeans Gale. All right, thank you, Joe. Um, and thank you everyone who joined us today. Uh, I do I do wanna just kind of briefly open by sending, you know, our, our wishes to our Florida members and, and all Americans in Florida being affected by the hurricane, uh, as well as Puerto Rico, where we have a few members, um, uh, especially thanks to the transportation workers who are working very hard right now uh, to keep these essential systems kind of battened down during the hurricane. Um, and I suppose that's as good a segue as any to transition to our topic today, which is state of US transit in 2022 and beyond. Um, this was a difficult intro to kind of gather and organize in my head because there's honestly a lot of contradictory data points out there. Um, can we get the next slide, Joe? I just went through my press clippings in the last two weeks and, and looked at some of the information, some of the data coming out of regional transit systems. Uh, you can see here Progressive Railroading and New York City, uh, MTA, as well as Lear, both logged new pandemic year ridership records. Next slide, Joe. At the same time, I think about a month ago, maybe a month and a half, MTA officials estimated that it would take until 2035 or 13 years for subway ridership to get back to when it was in 2019. Next slide. LA Metro, meanwhile, uh, are, are reporting that they are recovering from the pandemic faster than you know cities with higher transit usage as a percentage like New York City and Chicago. And they are aiming, I think it's an aggressive goal, but I'm, I'm happy to hear it for their ridership to get back to pre-COVID levels by mid 2023, which is good news. Pro probably tells you a little bit about you know who uses this system in LA uh, County. We also, Eno Center for Transportation uh, just did a expose on, not an expose, just did in-depth reporting on, you know, what happens when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic emergency funding uh, runs out, which is happening shortly here. You know, what happens to the, the, the funding model for a lot of transit agencies? It's very regionally specific, but, you know, to the, the extent that they are dependent on ridership uh, to to provide ticket revenue, uh, there that's going to be a model that needs to be re-examined. Re and can we get the next one, Joe? And then finally, from Chicago, you know, we see again another pandemic era ridership uh, record. Um, but that and and they're saying, you know, people are coming back to offices or coming back to downtown. However, that's well below the daily 1.6 million journeys uh, in the pre-pandemic era. So, I mean, I think that echoes a lot of what we've seen from our own experiences as transit riders, as users of the network. Um, it was a ghost town right when COVID began. I, I never, I, I used it less. I never stopped riding. Uh, you could definitely see trains where it's just you and one other person it slowly returned um and it has actually been in a way a little bit nicer in in certain point points of the day uh dc metro was was quite packed um both on the platform and in the subway so it's kind of given us i think breathing room uh across many transit agencies as we try to think about how we really bump up capacity to achieve those national goals um 
but there will be challenges. And that's why I'm happy that we have uh, the speakers we do, the panelists we do here today, because they are experts. They know a lot more than me. I'm an inner city specialist. Uh, and so can, can we get the next slide? So I'm happy to introduce Ark Zetti, who's the Vice President of Public Policy at the American Public Transit Association. He is a 40 plus year veteran uh, of the transit industry. Uh, he has both hands-on experience at New, New Jersey Transit and the Port Authority of Allegheny County, two of the bigger transit uh, agencies in the country. Uh, but he also, in his role, current role as uh, kind of head of policy and mobility at APTA, been thinking about, you know, how do we, the policy issues, but how do we integrate transit networks with new and emerging, uh, new and emerging transportation networks that includes bicycles, autonomous vehicles, micro transit, and inner city passenger rail, which is one of the key interfaces that we have uh, with ART. So Art, I'm going to turn it over to you and you can provide us uh, a little bit of a national perspective. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and thank you, Sean, and thanks for the ongoing partnership with the Rail Passenger Association and APTA. I am going to share my screen um, and show a few slides here. Let me jump. Yeah, this, um, hey, let's say this in a sentence. Transit providers have navigated change before. Right, uh, my own organization, the American Public Transportation Association, APTA, our roots go back to 1882. We're talking about before the internal combustion engine, we're talking about horse-drawn streetcars, right? So think of that, uh, that change. By the way, the, the challenges of the horse-drawn, uh, APTA was formed to deal with the challenges of the day, uh, pollution, congestion, and the cost of fuel. The more things change, the more things uh, stay the same. I think we're still facing those issues in, in other ways. Um, so, you know, we've gone from the horse-drawn streetcar era to, uh, to the electric streetcar era, which was, we forget how ubiquitous tra tra travel by public transit was at that time. It was everywhere. It was the way people moved. Of course, that led to uh, the disinvestment in streetcars and the investment in automotive modes. Uh, which is okay, you know, the, the bus is, is cool uh, too, but, um, but we started investing in nothing but roads and that became the focus of our policy and that led to urban challenges. Uh, fortunately, uh, we found how, and we rediscovered how important cities were uh, and there was a rebirth of transit, uh, at least uh, uh, the decline was slowed and we began reinvesting. And then more recently, the ever involving uh, the mobility ecosystem and the partnerships that go with it. Uh, this is a not, not a, a real clear slide, but uh, it shows the ridership over the years after started collecting ridership data in 1903. Uh, you'll see two peaks here. The first peak is, uh, by the way, right uh, after the 1918-1919 pandemic. Uh, that was, those were peak years of transit riderships. Those were the roaring 20s. I'm not saying things are the same now as they were in the 1920s. Uh, the you know, travel dynamics are different, but it's a historic fact. After the 1918-19 pandemic were uh, high ridership years, record years. Uh, the second peak came in the war years where... Um, you know, there was, there was a rallying around a national cause. You know, we, uh, we need to uh, be using our resources for purposes. Uh, you know, we, we rallied around the need to reduce automobile use, uh, devote petroleum to the, to the war effort. Uh, perhaps a similar calling could, could occur in future years. So I think both of those peaks uh, come with stories. Um, the future of transit is dependent on the health of cities. And the future of cities is dependent on uh, transit. And I say that's not a bad place to be uh, because uh, throughout history, cities have been uh, have nurtured, has been the place where innovation is nurtured. Uh, the clustering of people enables uh, new ideas that spark economic growth. Uh, that's been the case throughout the years, throughout the centuries. 
You know, cities have been where ideas are generated and where economic progress is sparked. Uh, so to have transit's future connected to cities, I'll take, uh, I will take that. Uh, that's documented in various books that I'd like to speak to, but maybe we can do that later. Um, you know, cities are ever evolving. You know, it's the, um, the notion of these big downtown skyscrapers that house offices. Uh, you know, yes, that, that fostered a lot of uh, commuter rail trips to the city, but that's not always been the case. It's, a, you know, cities have, you know, before, uh, say, the 1920s, uh, where the uh, skyscraper office buildings began to dominate city skylines, uh, cities were much more multi-use. They were for, um, you know, they were for um, the craftsmen. They were for people who lived downtown. We're seeing that trend come back again, too. So I'm saying uh, cities are ever evolving and um, transit systems are ever evolving. There is the rise of non-commute trips. I think that will be a focus of our discussion. So I won't talk uh, uh, too much about that. Um, but I will say, uh, you know, here there's a couple of pictures, the use of transit for um, who says it has to be about the commute, right? It can be about, um, uh, I was uh, talking, I was at recently, uh, just about a month ago, unveiling of a new soccer station in Austin, Texas. The Austin soccer team helped fund that station. And they had a big ribbon cutting that, that day. And um, the owner of the soccer team, it might've been the owner, might have the general manager, but some high person um, said all over the world, people travel to the soccer uh, stadiums by trains. Why not in the United States? And his vision is he wants to do that in Austin and we can do it around the country. You also see the nighttime economy. Uh, in my travels to cities, I see uh, perhaps in the day, they're not as vibrant as I can remember them. But good God, at night, they're every bit as vibrant. And I think the nighttime economy is, is uh, something we can, can think about. Um, these are some of the mobility trends that we can perhaps get into. But it is a very dynamic space. We have a lot to talk about. And I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Art. Uh, really good points there. First of all, buses are cool. Second of all, we do need um, we do need transit for cities to be vibrant, and uh, so whatever happens with the commute and how we drive uh, a lot of people to central business districts, if we want to achieve a lot of these national objectives about revitalizing city centers, we're going to need transit. Uh, that's why I'm happy that we have um, Alicia Trust, who is the uh, CCO, Chief Communications Officer of the. San Francisco Bay Area Rant Rapid Transit District, aka BART, it is the, I think, fifth largest transit agency in the country, and they just had their 50th birthday, so happy birthday to BART. Um, she's busy, and we really appreciate her time. She oversees all public relations, media relations, and social media and customer communication, so it's a big job. She reports straight to the general manager. She's been with BART for 10 years, and I'm hoping she can give us... Um, kind of the regional perspective from one of the, the really the biggest systems on the West Coast um, and the country. And so I'll turn it over to Alicia. Hello, yes, absolutely. All kinds of exciting things happening at BART and I'm so excited to present some of those things to you and then have a really fun conversation. It is our 50th anniversary. Um, we do have a lot of really fun merch related to our 50th anniversary right now at railgoods.com. Um, and if Let's see, I'm, will you stop sharing so I can share? I think that has to happen. There we go, perfect. All right, so always, I always get asked first up, like where are we at with ridership of BART? Um, and what you should know is our ridership literally is identical to office occupancy. So while there's all this great talk about, you know, non-commute trips, and yes, we're seeing that, I'm going to show you some of those data, we are still completely driven by how many people are going to the office. It's it's wild because we we talk about reimagining transit, reimagining BARD, and 
and getting non-commute trips. But when you see the data, it, you just kind of, you just laugh, you sort of throw your hands up, but, but we're getting there. This is the August data because September is not quite done yet. You'll see here, we're um, about 36% at the height of midweek. We're now seeing 40, 42% in September. That's great. We're offering 50% off. I think that plays a role. I think uh, more offices have reopened. And then you see those weekends um, at 56, 54, and really those have now reached 60, which is actually above budget. We have not been above our budget uh, in, since the pandemic started. So that's huge. And also worth pointing out Friday. So back in the day, um, Fridays was really low because a lot of people work from home on Friday. And there's sort of this expectation that Fridays are so low. I actually get reporters all the time. Oh, we're doing a story about how no one's riding transit on Friday. And I just love to like, well, actually, that's not what we're seeing at all. And what we're seeing is a lot of happy hour trips. I think people are working from home and then taking off early and heading wherever they want to head. And they are taking transit. So that's super exciting. Um, in terms of forecasts, this is sort of uh, what's budgeted and where we're actually at. I had mentioned to you, we're, we're right about where we're at, plus now we're inching a little bit above where we thought we were going to be. It also kind of shows this bleak outlook. You'll see here, this chart ends at fiscal year 24, and we're, we're assuming we'll only be at about 60%. And then when you look the 10-year forecast, as well as so this is the um, with some historical context so you can see like where we were, the small dips that we've seen over the decades. Um, so you'll see there where it dropped for the COVID pandemic. And our budget assumes there's three different base. There's a baseline, an upside, and a downside. And you'll see, and so it's, we matched that NTA. You had mentioned the New York was saying that even um, in, I think it was fiscal year 35, they didn't think they would just be reaching their 100%. That's pretty much what we're thinking too. It's gonna take 10 plus years, if you can imagine, to get back to where we were. And that's even with extending into Silicon Valley. And so this chart down below with the blue headers kind of shows you what those, those case scenarios are and gives you an idea of what we're assuming in our budget, this commute days per week uh, per worker. Um, and that the upside is only 3.6, but I think we have to be wise and, and, and budget accordingly because here is that famous fiscal cliff, all right? So we are literally only operating right now because of that um, federal money. You probably know BART is heavily reliant on Fairbox. That's gonna need to change. We are heavily already talking about that. We are saying we have to pretty much invert our funding model. We're gonna have to go to the ballot. It'll likely be all together with, with the region because all the transit systems are facing this. But our money runs out. Um, these are those three scenarios again, right? So that middle scenario is the baseline. We run out of money, it's clear 25. So that is sooner than you think and quite frightening actually. Um, some of the things we've been working on and we really did accelerate work during the pandemic and it's so important as we try to get people back to let them know that it's not the same BART that they left, you know, before they went um, in isolation during COVID. You know, you can now use your phone to pay for BART. That's a huge upgrade for us. It's easier to pay for parking. Half of our trains are now Fleet of the Future trains. Um, and the Fleet of the Future trains are, are so much better than the old trains for so many reasons. We finally have brand new escalators, which are under warranty. Hallelujah. Um, and we are seeing the data that all of this infrastructure rebuilding work we're doing, there are fewer delays because of the infrastructure. We had a horrible week last week. I just want to point that out. We're still trying to figure out why we had such um, disruptions. Um, so we're not perfect. We still have these delays, but we do have the data to the show that our infrastructure rebuilding work is working. Um, and then if you haven't heard, we do have near 14 air filters on every car. We were leaders in the industry for that. I think we were probably one of the first transit systems to actually install them in new and old cars, not just new cars. Um, you all need to know, and I'm sure you've heard, that the, the labor shortage is real. And as we talk about these initiatives, like may, what can we do to just increase service? That's what riders want. They want safe, of course, and they just want really frequent service. You just have to know that we and all transit systems are extremely struggling um, with train operators, train drivers, um, safety staff, electricians, mechanics, basically all of those jobs you need to run a good service. Um, we are struggling. One, it's it's not only are they, some of them are just quitting, but um, they have a lot of COVID leave. 
and the government keeps giving out more and more COVID leave. And guess what? The employees take it. They will find a way to take that leave. And that's what we're seeing right now. We have a lot of canceled trips that we really don't want and we have no control over it. Super exciting. We have um, enhanced our schedule um, and we are trying to do everything we possibly can with the staffing we have. Um, I know a lot of people on this call at least know what a clock based schedule is. So super excited that BART is moving towards that um, or actually we have implemented it. And for the first time ever, we actually have an identical matching weekend schedule. So we are more consistent than ever. And that's going to pay off for years as we um, get Monday through Sunday looking more and more alike. That also makes it easier for our transit partners to connect with us because you've probably heard there's 27 transit agencies in the Bay Area. It's not just BART. So it's important that we share our schedules and coordinate more. Um, and then to have better headways, I like to I like talking to you all because I can actually use some transit speak. Um, so the, the spacing between trains, we've been single tracking for like three years on nights and weekends and all that work is wrapping up. And that's huge for our riders because right now what it is is two trains go and then there's like a 28 minute gap and then two trains go and they're back to back and no one understands why in the world BART would schedule like that or it's to accommodate single tracking through very large um, portions of our system. Um, and then we've done some other improvements. Um, we're focusing on how to continue to improve our data feeds and offer more and more details like platform level details are coming soon. And then finally, as we do track shutdowns, um, something that we're just now pushing out is the bus bridges will be extremely clear um, when planning the trip in the trip planner instead of just having a note saying, hey, there's going to be a bus bridge. It'll actually show you the step by step. So that's really exciting for the customer experience. Also, we're leaders. If you haven't heard on progressive policing, we have our own. We do not contract out. That is what I'm so proud of. They are full time BART employees unarmed staff now. That is part of our approach. We're saying not everything needs a police response, an armed officer response. And in fact, when you put more unarmed staff out there, what that does is it lets those that are armed focus on the really, really, really critical calls. And the data is starting to show that it's working, which is exciting. So not only do we have these ambassadors, but we have crisis intervention specialists that really focus on those who um, are struggling with homelessness, mental health, and substance abuse. Um, Really important for you all to know that the general managers of all 27 Bay Area transit um, agencies are working more than ever before. It's one of those bright spots of the pandemic that we like to highlight. It really forced them all to basically meet weekly and try to get through this crisis together. Um, we're stronger together. We've launched this website where writers can go and they can get every bit of like the latest information of all 27 agencies instead of having to click through every different website. We're trying to do more consistent wayfinding and signage. In fact, we right now have um, a survey out. If you go to our website, um, even under news, you'll see that we've got a, um, we're trying to get more and more people to take this survey about these wayfinding and signage upgrades that provide consistency across the entire region. Um, and even for the first time, we're sharing some staffing and consultant supports on key topics, uh, which is a really big deal for transit agencies to do that, to be like, you know, we'll hire, we'll take the lead on it and we're gonna share these resources with everyone. Super exciting, we're finally getting into fare, um, fare integration for the Bay Area. I know a lot of systems already have that, we don't, we have no fare capping, we're just, we don't have it. And But we now have a super exciting pilot program where we're basically giving students free transit. And guess what? When you give people free transit, you know what? They ride transit more. So I'm super excited to track, track that data. And the next step will be to get large employers to be part of this uh, program. And I really, really hope that this is the future because um, I think it will, we will benefit from it. And I know that that big jump in September ridership has a lot to do with this Bay Pass and people using transit more. Um, and it is prepaid. We got, um, there's some funding from the local level to pay for it. So it's also this idea that, you know, Bart, like Bart just can't pay out of the kindness of our hearts when we are so reliant on Fairbox. Um, so something that's near and dear to my heart is this uh, concept of supporting families better that ride transit. And we know that we need to attract more families to get our ridership back up. Crucial to that is reopening these underground restrooms that have been closed since 9-11. So we've already opened four. And guess what? They get used a lot. Shocking, right? That people have to go to the restroom. And if you give them a nice clean restroom that has an attendant full time, they'll actually use it. And the restrooms are staying clean. So here's our rollout of our commitment to continue to open all these restrooms. And then almost getting to the end, just this idea, like I want to create memorable experiences for our riders right now. That's how we're going to attract these non-commute trips. 
We brought an arcade to Powell Street. We've got free short stories at several of our stations and we ran a contest um, and we filled the kiosks with the local authors. We're bringing music to our stations. Um, we're doing little things like incorporating the line colors better at BART instead of just saying it's the Antioch line, it's the yellow Antioch line. Um, and super exciting, I won't get into the details now, but um, we have a lot of initiatives to reduce sexual harassment because we know that it's a common barrier for women who travel. Um, and then just long-term, you know, we do have our eye on the future. Uh, we do have some schedule, like we want to improve nights and weekends. We know we have to. 30 minute uh, frequencies on the nights and weekends are is not gonna win us back riders, but we have to balance that with our infrastructure needs. And so know that it's really difficult for systems right now to just throw a bunch of train service out because one, we don't have the drivers and two, we're trying to rebuild our infrastructure and keep that in mind as the federal government gives us all this great infrastructure money, there's probably gonna be delays because then you have to build the infrastructure. We've got this great core capacity program that's going to let us run trains more frequently that's going to be rolled out in the next 10 years. We have our Link 21 program that will build us a second Transbay tube for rail. It'll pro We don't know yet exactly where it'll go and if it's going to accommodate both BART and um, you know, standard rail gauge, but that's sort of what we're looking at right now. We're taking this like big picture approach to it and not just the core, but like how do we connect the entire 21 county mega region we are going to San Jose, VTA is building it. It'll be done in 10 plus years. And then really fun, and we're gonna go out to, um, to survey this very soon, is we're advancing the BART Metro concept, which is the idea of enhancing our core service. So like really taking care of those that are making shorter trips and increasing the frequency as much. And so exciting, that means adding a sixth line to our map, which will provide redundancy to our yellow line and our blue line, which right now has only has one line. So Antioch and Dublin, you know, if that train gets canceled, you're out of luck, whereas other other lines have more redundant redundancies built in. All right, and that's it. I can't wait for the QA. Thank you, Alicia. That was a lot of cool information that I did not know. Um, I'm really excited about the uh, clock face and the headway info. Um, I know that we have a lot of transit nerds here with us uh, who will know what that means. But I think when I talk to non-transit users or, or intermittent transit users, that's kind of, even though if, even if they don't know it, that's kind of what they're looking for. It's just predictability, transparency, <laughs> the, the ability to show up and, and know your train's going to be there. And if you miss it, there's, there's one right after. We're always pushing Amtrak for more transparency um, in their scheduling. Um, Okay, and so now we're going to turn to the transit user. Uh, Hayden Clarkin is founder and CEO of TransitCon. He is not only a transportation engineer and planner uh, with more than four years of consulting experience in large-scale transit projects, he's also known as the transit guy. Um, I think he kind of integrates that engineer planner uh, perspective while also representing the passenger. Um, so his work includes heavy rail projects, uh, ADA accessibility design compliance, uh, bus rapid transit design, transportation engineering planning, and com complete street redesigns. Um, tran uh, sorry, TransitCon, of which he is the founder and CEO, is a free online transit platform that held its inaugural conference in January 2021 had 54 speakers and over a thousand registrants representing 41 countries, which is very impressive. So hopefully we get to hear a little bit more about uh, that. And I will turn it over to Hayden. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I appreciate uh, you, Sean and Joe and everyone who got this uh, event together. I really appreciate it. And Art and Alicia, I am huge fans. And so this is more of a fangirl moment for me than it is me being on a panel. So I really appreciate it. Um, I do feel like I'm a little bit of a psychic um, because I a lot of what I was going to talk about was short and sweet, but also really kind of hit on all of the points already made. So I'm really excited that I guess I can just hone that in a little bit more. Um, and so I, I came up with five learnings. I think there's obviously more learnings um, in a post-COVID era. And I don't want to use the word post-COVID because obviously COVID is still affecting um, a lot of people and there are still 
tragically people um, succumbing to it. Uh, more so kind of the post like lockdown era is where I'm kind of focusing on. And so I've come up with five learnings based on my advocacy, based on data, based on ridership, um, and based on kind of just some insights that I'm gaining based on anecdote, as well as just kind of what I'm hearing from um, the transit agency fans and nerds that I interface with. Um, and the first being is that people still want transit Yes, our ridership is down, but the commuter model is down. Um, the idea of the nine to five and planning around our, our service levels around that is, is largely something of the past that COVID has mostly gotten rid of. Um, and that's not a bad thing. I know Alicia alluded to happy hours on Friday. Nightlife is really big in New York City when it, in regards to transit ridership. Um, last week, uh, Metro North, uh, I think it was... Uh, 120% uh, pre-pandemic ridership. So they're actually exceeding it on the weekends, almost getting close to 100%. Um, the rest of the system, the inner city of um, of our subway systems and our bus systems, um, we're seeing about 65, 70% on a weekday um, for the subway uh, specifically. And then on the weekends, we're, we're seeing a, a higher recovery. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we are planning our service levels around that. And that causes issues now and, and a lack of demand when uh, frequency is higher, when people are trying to use it throughout the day. Um, and I think we kind of have to pivot to that. Number two, um, and obviously I'd love to talk about all of these. So I'm just kind of opening this up a little bit. But number two is first last mile connections are vital. We have experienced one of the biggest bike booms um, in modern transportation history over the pandemic. Bikes are hard to come by. There has been uh, bike renaissance, e-bikes are, 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 were, uh, outsold, um, uh, e-vehicles, electric vehicles, almost two to one, um, constantly seeing bikes interface with transit. So it's really, really important that a, uh, we are allowing transit, uh, heavy, like mass rapid transit, um, to interface with these first last mile connections, whether they're scooters, whether they're any sort of uh, um, uh, supplementary vehicle like a bike. Um, and that that kind of needs to change. Um, and we need to embrace that. A lot of people are taking bike trips instead of subway or bus rides. And how can we interface with that um, will be really important. Um, yeah. And then number three, this was just brought up, but embracing our labor outlook. Uh, the labor changes have been quite big. They have changed almost every industry uh, for better or for worse. Um, and the operator shortage is really kneecapping how we bring back riders and also how we bring back service. Uh, Muni is a perfect example of wanting to uh, add more lines and, and more service, but is really, really being kneecapped by the lack of riders. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, lack of operators. And so how do we bring those back? I don't know if we can. And so I think instead of doubling down on that, I believe that transit agencies um, need to start working and, and operating in a sense of automation. How can we make our service a little more self-sufficient? Do we need a station agent at every single entrance of every single station? That's a, something we can bring up. You know, in, in New York City, do we need to have two operators per every train? Uh, is that something that's sustainable given the new landscape of labor? Um, you know, while we design and build and extend new um, heavy rail transit systems? Can we actually automate those systems like they are doing right now in Spain? Is that something that we can do um, and, 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 and kind of lean in to the new labor landscape that we're, we're dealing with? Um, number four, riders want better insights and service. Translock recently did a survey. Um, they found that 74% of riders want better insights. This is something that I know Alicia just mentioned. Um, they want better insights. They want better information um, and not bells and whistles. They don't need Wi-Fi. They don't need a lot of fancy tech to be um, brought back on. Uh, we don't need any gadget bonds. We want our buses. We want them to run well. We want our trains to run well. We want them to be safe. We want them to be clean. Uh, that's how we get our riders back. And, uh, and any kind of lack of focus, I think, really, really muddles that 
that goal and that North Star. Uh, and it's really important. And I, I appreciate hearing more about wayfinding and signage. I think all of those things are really important as well as a really good UX uh, experience. Um, and then lastly, number five, uh, this also brings up the whole funding issue, rede redefining transit productivity. You know, when I talk to people in Twitter who don't like transit or like, oh, you know, um, Amtrak doesn't make a profit, you know, therefore we shouldn't have tr trains. I always bring up, you know, Metro North, BART, um, Caltrain as, well, actually these are very, there's a lack of subsidy. They're actually very high fare box recovery. And that's wonderful. And that works. And the funding has worked. Um, however, we really did see an invert where the uh, transit agencies that were so productive, if you will, um, actually fell the most during COVID as the money dried up the most because they were the least subsidized. And then the most subsidized uh, or the least productive, if you will, um, were able to better uh, withstand that lack of funding. And the idea that BART, you know, uh, cut its frequency at, at, at the beginning and in the middle of, of the pandemic was detrimental to the rider and obviously something that we didn't want to see. Caltrain was literally on the brink of fully closing, just like not running anymore. Um, these are vital services and um, having riders be the massive formula uh, for that that funding formula is is a real is a real problem as we look forward. And so I appreciate the the bringing up about the invert funding, Alicia. I, I think that's something really big. And you know, is transit productivity and agent product uh, transit agency productivity should that be based solely on how subsidized it is or how the lack thereof? Um, I think. COVID has kind of turned that around. Uh, obviously, we hope there's never another pandemic and this never has to happen again. Um, but it does bring up, you know, how are we going to backfill and, and stopgap these, these funding issues? And how do we uh, equitably give money to transit agencies based on their ridership um, so that this doesn't happen again? Um, so that's all for me right now. I'd love to answer any questions. But yeah, these are kind of the five big learnings. And I'm, I'm glad they were echoed by uh, the two previous speakers, Art and Alicia. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Hayden. And uh, thank you to all our panelists. I'm going to turn it over to Madison Butler, um, who is our, our head of comms. Uh, and she's going to, uh, they are going to um, turn it over to Q&A. I think we've had some submitted in the, uh, the chat. We also had some pre-submitted. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Maddie. Sweet. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, you know, I did TransitCon last year, had an absolute blast. Uh, met Alicia within my first couple of days with RPA and Art, your work continues to inspire our team. So thank you so much for taking the time to answer these questions. Um, thank you to everyone who sent in questions. And during any of our webinars, feel free to email me, join in the chat. We are kind of updating this thing in real time. So uh, we'll have a couple of those questions at the end for you that we saw in the chat. Uh, can you get the first question, Joe? Um, so this is one we've had a number of people set in. Um, as some of you may know, a number of our staff members actually had COVID symptoms after leaving our last conference, um, you know, on different means of public transportation. So what possibility do you see for creating certain designated mask required cars on trains? Um, and how can transit providers ensure continued access for immunocompromised people and those with disabilities, given the current like mask optional environment? Um, can we start with Alicia? Sure, yeah, and cool. some of you may know, uh, BART had a mask mandate um, and, and just recently our board extended it again through October 1st and then our, at our last board meeting um, said that what they wanna do is allow the general manager to put into place or keep a mask mandate if certain um, health um, metrics are, are if those triggers are met. And we did this um, mandate super creatively by changing our code of conduct because there was absolutely no, um, there were no longer any health officials backing transit. Um, not only that, but even APTA was against a mask mandate officially. And we now have even more people in the Bay Area, like such as the Bay Area Council writing into us, everyone just against mask mandates. 
And so our board did go in that direction to say, like, unless there's a mandate in place that impacts one of the counties, or if all of a sudden there's a surge anywhere in the U.S., um, because we know what happens is it starts one place and then it just spreads. And so if this, uh, so at this point, the mask mandate is going to go away October 2nd, and it'll be masks recommended um, unless there's another requirement somewhere that impacts where we serve or a surge. Um, and it is not possible, and we don't plan to do a designated car for mass required, uh, the same reason as we haven't been able to figure out how to do a woman's only car, right? I mean, and that's something that is frequently requested. Um, it's absolutely impossible to enforce, and it just puts us in a scenario where you're saying something is required, but no one seems to be following those rules. And it presents potential conflicts among staff when they're when we look when people look to them to be like, hey, force this person. Um, and so we kept that mandate longer than in anyone, I think. Um, and I'm and I'm proud that that we did that. But at this point, it's basically, you know, we're still giving out masks. We're going to continue to do that. And we just recommend that you wear a well-fitted mask and that we've got these air filters. Um, in place that do trap the virus. And um, not only that, but our air is replaced every 70 seconds. So we've we've done the technology upgrades and to keep the cars, you know, circulating air. Um, but at this point, in terms of a mask mandate, um, we, we will not have one as of October 2nd, which is unfortunate. And I understand that it's not what a lot of people want to hear. Yeah. I, I'll just chime in, you know, um, Alicia answered it very well, so I don't want to repeat comments, but I, I will say this. One of the reasons, in addition to enforcement, that APTA was not keen on it was, um, you know, it sort of sent a message, you know, to the public that transit's unsafe when at this, we had gone through extraordinary measures. We had not been the source of any uh, epispread uh, kind of thing. We should be applauded. Instead, we were being called out. Uh, if you want to ride transit, you have to make sure you protect yourself. So all, for all of those reasons, uh, we need to move forward. But if someone wants to wear a mask, we need to protect that right. And Hayden, as somebody who travels yeah. all over the country, right? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, 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 totally, I, I totally understand where people are coming from. You know, uh, I don't know many, like I'm just using New York City. I don't know many people in New York City who use the subway, but then also don't use the bus. And so uh, it's hard to have a first last mile of, you know, getting on a bus that doesn't have said, you know, isolation principles or, you know, mm -hmm. any way to isolate and then going on to a subway car. I can see this happening on Amtrak, kind of like a quiet car type thing for long distance routes. I don't see it for for a subway um, like system, it, it just it wouldn't work as well as it would really provide uh, uh, capacity issues. Should very few people want a mask and they're in one car and the other car is completely full, that's not going to work on the L train or the seven train. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> um, so it's hard, and I will agree with Art. I, I was very, uh, I think, I think it was very controversial of me at the time, and I got a lot of pushback on it. I, I didn't appreciate when um, the CDC had recommended that all mass mandates were lifted outside of transit. I found that the connotation that transit is dirty and um, unsafe to be quite offensive. Um, I, I, you know, I'm closer to the person in front of me at Whole Foods grocery store and, and they're not masked. So the idea that I'm going to be on a train and for some reason that spreads it quicker, you know, yeah. Alaska, Rhode Island and North Dakota had the most COVID infections. I don't associate them with subways or transit. So um, a little bit of pushback personally, but yeah, I, I see that hard. Maybe in, maybe on intercity uh, travel that could happen, but I don't see that in intercity um, travel. Well, well, I appreciate y'all answering it. It's obviously something contentious. It could become a little bit spicy. Everybody has opinions, but we do want to hear from everybody and just know where our members are at with this. So I appreciate it. Uh, let's move on to our next question. Uh, can the speakers address the balance between finding funding and attendant struggles with the uh, demonstrated increase in ridership, especially like social justice targeted? Do you mean um, attendance struggles? Are you talking about our employees? And I think the question, sorry to interrupt, was yeah, some of the transit systems have experimented with free fares. Um, I think in Germany, uh, with the inner city line, they have subsidized heavily a lot of the 
um, the fares as a way to help people deal with rising fuel prices. Um, and, and so there is, you know, you, you see a boost in ridership, but you also see an erosion of the uh, fair revenue model. So if you could talk about, you know, the balance between uh, subsidized or even fr free fare weekends yeah. um, versus, versus the need to adhere to a user pay system, that would be, I think I'd be interested in, or, or yeah. I'd be interested in hearing. So number one is people need to understand the various funding models for every agency. And there are some agencies that could provide free fares and it really wouldn't impact them because they're getting significant sales tax money. For example, everyone thought sales tax was going to plummet during COVID. And then instead everyone like just bought stuff while at home, probably for like the dopamine effect. I don't know. But um, but for, <laughs> for, for BART, which is truly fare dependent reliant, had we gone free fare just off federal money, we would have already ran out of our money and started having to lay off people, which I also know you all don't want. The governor of California then um, suggested free for, free transit, um, and then didn't didn't make it through the legislature. And I was thinking, this is this is it. This is the time we're going to have this pilot study. What would free transit do for Bart? What does it do to the crime rate? You also have to think about that. It just is just like you know the doors are open. I would argue I don't think it would have much impact. I feel that anyone who wants to do anything bad is going to make their way onto the system anyways. Um, but there are plenty of people I work with that would disagree with that and think that free transit um, could not would not be good for our crime rate and such. Um, and so unless there's sustainable funding and it has to be sustainable, there is no possibility for free transit, at least for BART. And I know there's other systems um, that are there. But it, I do think there is a moral obligation to have low income discounts, right? And you and very good youth discounts. And e even for those that are fare box dependent. So BART, finally, we have 20%, which is not enough. And even our board says, you know, we, we got to find more. And so we have to be aggressive and like, you know, trying to get grant funding. We have to pay for it somehow. Um, and that's why I'm excited about Clipper Bay Pass because we're getting other places to, to fund these programs. And then we're gonna have all the data to show that if you give people not just free BART, but free transit in the Bay Area, they're gonna ride it more. And so then maybe we'll have that data to go and convince the legislature, whether at the state level or federal level, level or convince large employers, you know, the Cloroxes, Kaiser, you know, sales forces, y'all need to buy these passes for your employees, pay for them, and then it helps um, take the pressure off our back, so then that maybe we can increase the low income um, discount, right? Um, so that so that's from a perspective of a you know heavily reliant on Fairbox uh, agency. Uh, I'll jump in here too with just a, a couple thoughts. One, it is a very uh, caught debatable topic. There are points on both sides, and uh, there's no one answer to it. But the the point I would like to make it's sometimes viewed as in total all in the uh, eyes of a social equity lens, which is an important part. And the low income fare uh, should be considered by everybody. Uh, but let me just also mention, uh, you know, A, it has uh, ease of boarding uh, things, right? If you can board quickly without fumbling for, for fare or you know, whether it be uh, on the vehicle or at a turnstile or whatnot, right? Uh, also, I know I, we, we have to think of the KISS, keep it simple. KISS, and uh, if uh, it's too many times we don't, and you know you can uh, you know pull an Uber with a, a simple app and, and transit, it's it's a little harder than that. You have to figure out how much it costs and how to pay for it and how you get your ticket, and uh, we should keep it simple. Also, the cost of collecting is actually, especially for smaller systems, is quite a lot. Uh, you know, and uh, sometimes you wonder how much are you spending to collect versus how much you collect. So all of those things are part of uh, part of the decision framework. Yeah, the, the only thing I will say, um, I know the German, um, the German pilot was uh, quite successful. Uh, yeah, I think I believe it was nine euros for the whole month for most or if not all transit. So it wasn't technically free. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely believe that there should be some sort of promotions that transit agencies can run on a weekend or maybe on a on a weekday out of each month to try to see if they can get 
um, those riders back. But I will say that, you know, the last couple of months, we had some of the highest gas prices we've ever had in the country. So, you know, making it free versus <laughs> the benefit of getting on a bus that was the same cost while gas prices were nearing $5 or $6 a gallon, um, that in itself was uh, a, 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 a value. Um, I would argue that there were many transit agencies that did not uh, capitalize on the free advertisement of very high gas prices, uh, cough, cough, WMATA and others um, that really didn't meet that need in order to bring those people back, right? They need a, they need an escape from high gas prices. You know, they're getting on BART, they're getting on LL Metro, they're getting on these places. Let's give them uh, the best experience they can have so that they can we can alter behavior and, and, and change kind of the way that they view transit as, as they desperately need relief financially. Um, I think... I think we we did the best we could, um, and unfortunately, I, I, I do think uh, too many transit agencies are, are are far too dependent on our fare box recovery in order to to have that cost benefit uh, ratio work out. Yeah, and I'd just like to add, um, you know, there's this quote from the former mayor of Bogota, Bogota, where he said, "A developed country is not a place where the poor have cars; it's where the rich use public transportation." So I don't think public transit should be a social wear, welfare program. Now, there's ways the social welfare state can interface the, with public transportation. But, you know, I think a good, uh, a healthy transit system includes all spectrum, parts of the demographic spectrum. You can see public policy cases for, for instance, the TGV in France, where, you know, they have flat fares. So the New York to D.C. equivalent, you just get it for a flat 40 euro fee and it's not going to shift based on on demand and, and surge and and uh, surge in ridership and I think there's a lot of uh, arguments for that but you know I do think it is important that we understand that um, we need to move to a place where everyone is using uh, transit systems not just not just people who can't afford cars Sean and off that really quickly I, I would say, um, as someone who lives on the Northeast Corridor, um, Amtrak prices on the Northeast Corridor are cost prohibitive. They are absolutely crazy depending on when you buy. I don't know the the easeability of being of having to know I have to book an Amtrak ticket three months out in order to get a good deal is not transit, in my opinion. Um, and my brother, who was trying to visit me from Boston, actually flew from Boston to New York City to visit me because it was cheaper by a long shot than taking Amtrak. So I actually think the idea of um, of price maximums on on, on on transit is something I find to be uh, quite interesting. Whether that's a per mile basis, if we're talking about um, you know WMATA or some or, or maybe BART, um, but the idea that we're just doing free, I just don't think is um, possible. Cool. All right. Let's grab the next question. Uh, do you think more people will take the train because they get to leave from a fancy new station or will passengers be happy with an ATM that issues tickets and a train that gets them there faster? So this is more, you know, um, aesthetics, seating areas and um, like, you know, there's been a number of BART expansions lately. I thought they were beautiful, um, but I would love to hear y'all's thought on the aesthetics. Uh, I'll jump in with with a thought. Yeah, and I, you know we might all have different views on this. I I would view that um, that it is important. You know, we should the the transit rider should be um, the infrastructure. Uh, the the it speaks to you, right? If you're um, if if you're at a, a nice station, um, I think that speaks to the to the. Um, you know, to the value of the of the trip, and uh, you know, I, I know, for example, transit. I think too many times we uh, position transit rider to seem like it's a second class choice. So I think by um, by making things uh, uh, you know as as good as they can be, um, you know, and, and you know, for example, the heat uh, when you're waiting for a bus or a train in 110 degrees, uh, you know, I, I I think that's not what we want. That's not the image we want. So if you can have waiting areas that uh, you know respect dignity uh, and 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 show value, you know, I I like the idea of the transit station being the the center of the community, and the community built around it. And uh, uh, if it's grand, uh, in my view, that's the way it should be. So I'll pause there. 
So I would add that the question conflates the operating budget and the capital budget, which are two very different budgets. And I want to remind people where we typically get money to build beautiful things and just to build things in general. And it's usually federal funds. And we can't forget about the job creation elements and those high wage jobs that go into building um, a station. There's definitely, you know, what is too big of a station? And that is an absolute argument and debate people should have. Um, but it's it's not money we can use to run the system. So it's it's not fair to put the two together. And I just want to gently remind people, like, these are job creating, which is why the federal government likes it, because the lawmakers like to be able to say, look how many um, jobs we created from building fancy new stations. Um, and then I was going to also point out the elements um, we would be very upset with a transit system that didn't have, you know, el you know, to, to protect you from the elements while you while you're waiting for a bus or or a train. Um, and place making is 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 so important um, as we seek to to build houses around our station. So if you do you want to own a house, hopefully affordable. Um, when all there is is the ATM that you can buy a ticket, probably not. You probably want something a little bit more meaningful to help with the sound, um, impacts to you. And so, so that, that's another part of our strategy is just building housing on our parking lots at BART. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I echo the kind of the old adage that, uh, I'm looking for transit that respects me. Right. So fancy is a is an interesting term. I'm kind of looking for clean. I'm looking for safe. I'm looking for accessible keyword accessible. Uh, you know, we have CTA and New York City that won't have accessible uh, stations throughout their system until I think 2035, 2040 now, depending on the, the goalposts. Um, Appreciate BART being fully ADA accessible. Um, so that's kind of something re respectful, right? That's that's a huge barrier to the system. Uh, Moyenhan is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful station um, on top of a pretty bad service pattern <laughs> or limiting uh, capacity service pattern. A lot of times these things are lipstick on a pig. I appreciate it, but the novelty wears off. Having clean, safe, accessible, frequent um, transit is great. Having bus shelters, is awesome. All of those things are great. Um, but I think we really just need to focus on what transit's good at, and that's moving people. Um, and I think that's important. I live in New York City. I use New York, New York City transit all the time. I'm the first to tell people, like, how hard is it to clean that tile? Give me a rag. I will do it. Um, but that's, that's the hard part. New York City is focused on moving people 24 hours a day. So maintenance is goes by the wayside. Um, and so I would take that trade off. I appreciate people who enjoy the novelty of getting onto it. But when I was living in uh, really quickly, when I was living in uh, Stuttgart, Germany, I was on a very dingy train station and a woman next to me every single morning on the same commute as me was wearing Louis Vuitton $800 shoes. And she got on the train with me every day. Why? Because it was the quickest way to the city not because it was the most glamorous. So I appreciate all the comments about fancy and clean, uh, fancy, um, but I, I think just transit that respects a rider is is, is good enough, at least in, in terms of sub, subjective America, <laughs> right? Sean, do you have any thoughts? No, they've hit it. They've hit it very well. Yeah, yeah I really like that respectability angle. It's very cool hidden. Um, all right. So certain transit systems, uh, Metro, WMATA, uh, were struggling to accommodate passenger demands before the pandemic hit. Uh, the drop in ridership has given these agencies breathing space while they advance capacity expansion projects. Do you see any unexpected opportunities that can come with the increase in telecommuting and the impact that it's had on transit ridership? Yeah. I think we've kind of touched on this a little bit. Yes, but I'll just jump in to be blunt about it. Please. It forcing, which for people that do what I do, it's forcing us to have better nights and weekend service. Before you could literally just get away with like, no commute is bread and butter. We're going to do all of our rebuilding on the weekend. Like, you know, it's like almost like second class, you know, um, and now we have to have, so I'm so excited that we get to finally, you know, improve nights and weekends, something that all of us transit advocates have been asking for for decades, but now this is a chance and it has created space to think about making transit safe for women and um, and um, non-binary people and transgender. And because it's, again, it's sort of this like, 
for, forcing us to. I've, I've been speaking to all sorts of agencies. They're all launching these initiatives. LA Metro has really been the lead, and then, and then Bart had our Not One More Girl initiative. That's I, I can't tell you. I probably have one meeting a week from other agencies wanting to know, you know, how can we begin to um, make women and 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 children feel safer on transit. And so I think the pandemic is, is actually giving us the space to kind of work on those programs. Um, so that's exciting, as well as some of these playing around with things we you never would have been able to play around with before, you know, or 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 accelerating these great technology improvements. So that there is there is some space that's creating opportunities. Yeah, the, the point I'll make here is just in the way we we count. Take for example, if someone used to ride the train five days a week. Now there's you know, new work patterns setting in. Maybe they're gonna ride the train three days a week to work or, or two days a week. Say they ride two days a week. That's 40% of what they used to ride. But does that make the train any less important? So that's, that's, that's why it's a little dangerous to look at numbers. That's 40% of the ridership trips but yet that train is the way for that person to get to work. It's the way, uh, you know, the, the option for them. So I, I think we're being, we're moving towards a time that's overdue that um, it's, you know, ridership is not the metric. It's a metric, but not the metric to measure the value of transit. And I think that's come full square during the pandemic, where many times we were urging people don't ride unless you have to. But we kept cities working. We connected essential workers to their job. Uh, because the ridership numbers were low, did that mean transit was any less important, right? The answer is obvious. So while we're talking about rebuilding ridership today, I'm suggesting we should be thinking of metrics other than ridership to measure the value. Yeah, I think we've had, we've had a, I think, I don't know, four, maybe I'm just going to throw out a number for 60 years, we've had uh, a, a, a chicken or the egg conundrum, right? We've always been focused on the nine to five commuter. And if you are a person who's third shift in America, I, I don't know what transit agency you've been taking that would be able to get you <laughs> or respect you enough to get you to your work um, and, and back uh, early in the morning and late at night. Um, and so we're, we're kind of changing this conundrum a little bit. We, we're moving the chicken to the egg situation and we're now trying to open up, um, you know, instead of calling the term commuter rail, we're now using mostly using the word regional rail. And we're trying to figure out how do we get riders who have never felt like the nine to five uh, uh, service pattern worked for them and how do we bring those people back? And, and, and that's a huge, uh, you know, a lot of people work third shift and a lot of people could ride BART and, and the same goes for other transit agencies, right? Um, and so bringing those people into the mix, I think that's really exciting. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm excited for it. Maybe I'm the only one who's optimistic that like nine to five, you know, <laughs> peak hour factor is kind of dead. Um, but I think it's an exciting opportunity to work for every user and not just people going to, you know, work in uh, Manhattan every day <laughs> at, at nine o'clock in the morning and leaving at five or six. So I don't see an issue with it. And I'll just briefly add that, you know, moving it beyond the transit, like broadening the, the aperture from transit to the transportation network, the vast majority of work from home and flexible schedule commuters in the U.S. context are going to be drivers. Uh, they're going to be using highways and roads, and I would hope that this would give us a moment to reappraise how much money we spend on highway expansion uh, for limited limited benefits and start thinking about how we rebalance uh, the transportation network um, to allow people uh, a high quality of life, which again, as we've talked about, transit is going to be a big part of. Um, and I know we're going long, but we, this is a really interesting conversation. I think, uh, Maddie, you might be able to bring us home um, with one last question. Um, yeah, we've kind of um, touched on it a little bit with um, just addressing off-peak transit service uh, for workers with odd schedules. But I kind of wanted to ask, like, how do you all see over the next like three to five years better incorporation of people who do, you know, work at non-peak hours? Um, and where do you think agencies are kind of missing the mark right now? Well, I'm going to jump in first to make a, a very quick comment. It's not going to answer the question in its full breath, but it's going to get to the point of reinvention. 
<clears throat> Alicia mentioned uh, maybe they're starting to think of BART more, BART more as a metro type system with shorter trips. A lot of the commuter railroads are definitely thinking that. Some are thinking of the term regional rail instead of commuter rail, <clears throat> uh, but all of them are thinking in different ways. Uh, so, uh, and, and anyway, it's a, a broad answer to the question, but I wanted to register it, so thank you. I think one area that um, we're behind, um, besides, you know, just obvious in terms of service, is when we do surveys and how we group people and segment people, and it's something I'm trying to work on here, where, like, if you're a weekend writer, you're just, you're, you're a weekend writer, whereas, like, on the weekdays, we care so much about, well, what hours are you writing, and, and what day of the week, and are you still coming on Mondays and Fridays when like weekends are like, oh, and then we just group you all here. But that's the same for night as well. Um, but I want to point out we BART had closed at 9 p.m. during the pandemic um, so we can accelerate uh, all this great infrastructure work as well as to, to save money and the, to use our precious staffing resources as wisely as possible. And it was because of the advocacy of, of those like bakers and um, hotel workers you know, the numbers probably weren't even going to be there, but but it was that advocacy and pressure to extend our hours back to midnight um, that, that got us to do that. So part of it is, you know, you have to keep up the advocacy to keep the pressure on that. And, and it does work. So us going from 9 p.m. to midnight, when we did, we probably could have continued to do 9 p.m. for a little bit longer, but it's really about those workers. Um, but it's just a resource question, and especially with um, the uh, employee shortage right now. Yeah, um, that brings up a really good point. One of the one of the case studies I was actually reading an article about um, yesterday about I don't want to use the word winner or losers during the pandemic era. That's a pretty horrible um, phraseology. Um, but the someone brought up uh, Universal Studios Orlando versus Disney, and Disney stopped all of their construction, all of their maintenance, and everything of all their parks during the pandemic because they were uncertain of what was going to happen next, financially and otherwise. Universal actually doubled down on most of their maintenance as well as continuing to build a brand new park. Um, and analysts say that if Disney were to build right now, or if Orlando were to start, uh, uh, Universal were to start building their park now, it would cost about three to four times what the cost is when they were building during COVID. Um, and I think a lot of transit agencies, BART included, they capitalized uh, on the lack of ridership in order to make very large uh, investments and, and fixes in, in their maintenance and rail. So I think that's really, really important. Um, I, I see that kind of passing, and I think we're now back to normal when it comes to major delays if we're trying to get back to that maintenance and we didn't ca capitalize on it before. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking of my home, home state of Rhode Island, RIPTA for most of all of its routes ends at 8 p.m. Um, and so if we're, so if we're working on how do we go, you know, create service from 8 to 6 a.m. in the morning, that is a huge revolution in transit that I welcome and, and advocate for, right? Just think about it. You need dispatchers. You need a whole new group of, uh, of operators that will work in the middle of the night for all of these third shift workers. Um, you know, you need mechanics. A lot of institutional changes would happen, would have to happen at every transit agency in order to make them robust 24 hour systems. And I welcome that. Um, change in that advocacy, and it will take time to do that as we settle into the new post-pandemic era. So, great. Well, and I think that's definitely you know advocacy that some of our members would like to support. Um, and thank you all seriously so much for taking the time to answer all of our questions. Um, and we'll follow up with everybody who posted questions in the chat. Uh, include that on our link at railpassengers.org/webinars, as well as this presentation. Um, so Art, Alicia, Hayden, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm gonna kick it over to Joe to talk about our upcoming fall conference. Uh, before, I, before I get to what was going on uh, next month for us, I, I do wanna thank Alicia, Hayden and Art. Um, I, I, will, I will say as a, I, I, I do this work as, as a passionate advocate across the country, but I am a city a Chicago boy at heart. So let me give a shout out to, uh, to uh, RTA, CTA, Metro, uh, you know, like our, 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 our pound for pound system of uh, my back home. But I, I am a fanboy, fangirl of all three of you. You guys are icons for what we do uh, for when it comes to uh, to transit and advocacy. So um, I, I stand on the shoulders of giants a lot of times for what I do when I travel the country. So uh, thank you all three of you for, for being here, giving fantastic answers. This was a wonderful uh, webinar. And so, uh, you know, worth worthy of going 10 minutes over. Um, so that said, let me pull up the slide. Um, 
We are doing something a little different with our fall meeting this year. Um, you all know that we do our, our annual meeting in DC um, every April, every spring. We are handing it over to uh, the council and uh, to our uh, council committee and our members uh, for putting together an agenda, uh, uh, inviting speakers and, and a whole lot of events for, for a quick weekend. Uh, so if you are uh, in the Kansas City area or uh, can, you know, can travel uh, next month, please go to railpassers.org slash events. I do believe it's uh, RNKC2022 uh, to be sp uh, specific with our website, but you'll find registration, hotel information, and um, what's going on Friday night, all day Saturday, and a, and a quick, uh, great tour uh, of uh, Kansas City Union Station on Sunday. Um, and always uh, thank you all for attending, not just our speakers, but uh, we can't do this without our supporters, with our members, without everybody out there. So please, uh, stay active, join our campaigns, donate railpassers.org slash donates. Uh, we can't do what we do without you. Uh, and plus join in our digital conversation uh, at Rail Passengers uh, on Instagram and Facebook, also on Twitter. Um, so uh, join in and uh, stay tuned. We have a couple, a bunch of really great uh, uh, events coming up soon. A couple pre-taped uh, uh, round tables that we're gonna try to do and we'll be back with our webinars uh, in November um, with, uh, with a great topic. So uh, thank you everyone for coming and enjoy um, your weekend. Thank you.